Hello, welcome. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. So we'll start with the plant again this evening. Uh, welcome everybody. This is the island bush poppy, Dendromecon harfardii. Smells like cantaloupe. Um, this is a, a plant that I think brings together our two guests today very well, because on the one hand, it's a beautiful, chic plant, wonderful for, for design in uh, landscapes in Los Angeles. And it's also an interesting wild plant from the Channel Islands where uh, our second guest uh, began his career in conservation. Um, today's show is gonna be an interesting one. I'm thinking about the concepts of deconstruction and reconstruction. And we'll see that starting in the garden where the owner deconstructed a concrete backyard and put it back together to form a beautiful, um, a beautiful space for her family and for wildlife and plants. And our second guest, uh, his job is to manage nature and that often includes reconstructing. And in order to do that effectively, he may need to deconstruct some of the notions of how we do that. I'm Evan Meyer, Executive Director at the Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, welcome to Poppy Hour. Margaret Oakley, my co-host, how are you doing tonight? Hi, Evan. Um, I'm doing pretty well. I, it's been an interesting week in the quarantine lifestyle. Um, it was Earth Day on Wednesday. Happy and, Earth Day. Yeah, happy Earth Day. I was thinking about Earth Day and all my complicated feelings about it. Um, you know, it started as a as kind of a way of raising public consciousness in 1970 around issues of air pollution and water pollution. And so much good has come out of the Earth Day movement, including laws to protect clean air and water. Um, but in the last several years, when I would go to Earth Day events, they tended to be these really large scale things. Um, people kind of aggressively needing to find an activity to do on Earth Day. And often, you know, people were distributing plastic water bottles and food grown by, um, well, food that was part of the industrial agriculture system, certainly not sustainable. And uh, I just kind of started hating Earth Day, but then it was such a different Earth Day this Wednesday. Um, Very different. Yeah. No large gatherings. Well, I'm agnostic about Earth Day. Um, I think it's great that people want to celebrate the environment. Um, yeah, that's. I don't really have many thoughts on Earth Day, but I can see that. Yeah, producing a lot of like Chinese plastic um, Earth Day, you know, logo wares, not very sustainable. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is probably a good moment for me to mention that the views uh, on this show are not the views of the Theodore Payne Foundation, although we work for Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, these are individual views, and uh, I probably should yeah. mention that disclaimer. Yes, and we, we're a non-political show. We're a show about plants and nature, um, but these are political things, and they sometimes will involve political discussions and any political opinions are those of the presenters and the guests. They don't, we don't speak for any organization. Um, yeah, so happy Earth Day, everybody. Uh, what are your thoughts on Earth Day? Oh. Um, yeah, happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, I have kind of similar thoughts to Margaret. Um, I have been really like thinking about Earth Day in this pandemic and just thinking about the earth generally and how the huge actions that we have been able to take, although a lot of them have been really painful, um, have been, some of them have been really positive for the environment. Um, and it in some way gives me hope that if we can take these kinds of actions um, for a pandemic, we can and we certainly are going to need to uh, take similarly um, unfathomably large um, actions to address um, climate change and the environmental issues that we face. 
Um, so I'm also heartened that this Earth Day, I think, was actually a lot kinder um, and lower impact to the planet than a lot of Earth Days that we've had previously. Um, and that, that gives me some hope. Um, I just want to uh, go through, just mention a couple of quick uh, tech things. Um, we do want this show to be participatory. Um, so thank you all for all of you who are joining us live um, on Zoom and also are following along on our YouTube live stream. Uh, this show will also be archived on the Theodore Payne YouTube channel. Um, so if you miss it live, you can watch it there. Um, if you are not already following Theodore Payne Foundation on YouTube, it would actually be really helpful to us um, if you could do that. Um, YouTube reserves some functions for, um, for accounts that have a certain number of followers. Um, so that would be an easy way for you to help us out. Um, and tell your last, friends too. Yes, please tell your friends. Thank you, Evan. Um, and in term, we have a live, um, we have, so we have a chat function in Zoom um, that you are free to use um, to communicate with us and as well as with each other. Um, in Zoom, there's also the Q&A function. Um, if you have specific questions um, for us or for our panelists, um, I would encourage you to use the Q&A function and we'll try to get to those. Um, for those of you on YouTube, um, also feel free to um, answer, ask any questions there and we'll do our best to um, try to address those. All right, Margaret. Um, thank you, Philip. I noticed that you took an action, <laughs> which is you shaved your beard. Do you wanna tell a little bit about why you did that? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I was, I'm, I'm ready to do, um, you know, whatever it takes to end this pandemic. I'm open to exploring many options, um, both big and small. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm ready for, I'm ready for a shift in energy, um, which that definitely was, uh, you know, at least well, symbolically. And there's a practical functionality there too, because having a beard um, makes wearing a face mask less effective. So. You're also, you know, protecting everyone by shaving your beard. Maybe I should do the same thing. It's a really good point, Evan. <laughs> um, I think it's that time, Evan. It's oh time. yes, sponsor time. Sponsor time. Time to thank our amazing sponsors who have come yeah. on board to support Poppy Hour. We are so honored to have been uh, receiving these sponsorships from such great organizations. Um, I'd like to just read a couple of things real quick and you guys should all check out what they're doing because they're doing amazing work to, um, to promote sustainability and biodiversity in Los Angeles and beyond. Um, so first I'd like to thank the Gottlieb Native Garden, um, which is uh, sponsoring the entire season of Poppy Hour. And they, if you haven't been there, it's an amazing, diverse, flourishing garden in Beverly Hills, um, just a few miles from Rodeo Drive. They have a website you should check out um, got the Gottlieb native garden.com. They'll be doing book giveaways in future episodes. Stay tuned. They have three books and um, it's just a fantastic place. You should definitely check out their website and follow them on social media. Um, I'd like to then thank the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. They've also sponsored the whole season. Um, they are promoting outdoor water efficiency through their $3 a square foot turf replacement rebate which means you can get money to change your yard to an awesome native plant landscape, which is a pretty sweet deal. Um, visit ladwp.com slash landscaping for turf, turf replacement rebate details and garden resources. You can access virtual garden tours, learn about workshops to help improve your outdoor water efficiency. And you can apply directly for the turf replacement rebate at www.socalwatersmart.com. Uh, and our final sponsor, who has also sponsored the entire season, is the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California um, through their community partnering program. Uh, native plants are the perfect candidates for Metropolitan's turf replacement rebate available through Southern California. So another great option to look into. Um, check out their native plant profiles, take a virtual tour of the Colorado River Aqueduct. That's pretty cool. I think I'm gonna do that myself and uh, apply for water saving device rebates at bewaterwise.com. Um, yeah, thank you to our sponsors. 
we are so honored to have you guys and and anyone who's tuning in you should check out these folks um they're doing some great stuff and you can save money and have a better garden than just a boring old lawn everybody wants that right um indeed they do <laughs> um all right well i think that was a pretty solid uh intro to our show <laughs> maybe it's time <laughs> to uh to bring up our first guest um head over to highland park so oh, should we introduce who, who we've got today first real quick maybe yeah um all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce who's coming next, and then you introduce our garden host. Uh, and then we'll go, we'll go over to our garden in Highland Park. Um, but before, just so everyone knows what's coming up next, uh, um, after this beautiful garden we're about to see, we're going to talk with Dr. Charlie De La Rosa from the San Diego Zoo. Um, and we're going to get really thoughtful and philosophical about what it means to protect nature in uh, this era that we're in, this time of human dominance over the planet. So I think it'll be very interesting. But before that, we have another very interesting person. Margaret, do you want to introduce our, our guest? Yeah, so I'm so excited that Lake Park uh, agreed to, I'm sorry, Lake Sharp <laughs> agreed to join us um, on today's episode. <laughs> I, I already started having my cocktail for poppy hour, if you can't tell. Um, so Lake has been involved with the Theodore Payne community for many years, and she uh, has shared her garden on previous native plant garden tours. Um, she's a designer that works across multiple mediums, uh, garden design, she does ceramics, and also started a really interesting um, gym project called Everybody, uh, which is um, based around inclusivity and um, body positivity. So I'm excited to have this conversation with Lake. And uh, yeah, will you say hello to us, Lake? Hi, hello, hello. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I love the Theater Pain Foundation and um, I love talking about plants and wellness and environmental and social justice. So it's just a pleasure to be here. Right on. And uh, will you tell us a little bit about your garden in Highland Park and sort of how you got started um, creating your home garden space? Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate to buy a nice large piece of property in 2013, which was largely ignored and untouched for decades um, and really didn't have any um, existing plants except for a very uh, healthy Mexican lime tree and then a couple of palm trees and then a very unhealthy ash tree that bit the dust shortly after we moved in. But what was so exciting about the property is that it was basically this beautiful blank canvas and um, that sort of started my whole journey into researching and learning about native plants and creating habitat and kind of restoring um, a little piece of land back to like a really vibrant and fertile and kind of wild and rangy garden. Yeah, and I think that's an aesthetic that um, you've really embraced in your home landscape and in designed landscapes that I've seen of yours. And I really appreciate that because um, I think that this uh, idea of having a really manicured landscape is is problematic resource wise um, in many ways and uh, you can have something that feels really functional and usable and friendly but um, the wild aesthetic is is really nice in your yard so will you show us um, let's get started kind of showing some views through okay. our zoom video Okay, so I'm basically starting at the side yard. I'm gonna to try to hold it steady, bear with me. Um, this is the side of our property kind of leading down into the backyard where we have this little poppy and sweet alyssum and lupine field that kind of volunteers itself every season. So, and then we have a couple um, 
pots with like a cliff spurge and some euphorbia. And what's most exciting, I think, about watching this garden grow is allowing whatever wants to thrive to thrive with sometimes really surprising results. Um, so part of the surprising result has been this, let me see here. This is a field of German chamomile, which has volunteered itself on our patio. <laughs> and that German chamomile started in our herb garden, which I'll show you in a little bit, but much prefers this spot and just comes up on its own every season, every spring and completely transforms this space. Part of what I think is so exciting about having a native garden or just having a garden that kind of does its own thing with your stewardship is seeing how spaces transform throughout the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have a cameo. <laughs> yeah, you're watching me right now. Um, zoom bomber. Yeah, <laughs> zoom bomb. Zoom bomb. <laughs> One thing um, I wanted to show you before we go down there too is the experiment for 2020 is trying to reintroduce, reintroduce some um, beneficial predators in the form of this might be controversial for some people, but we put a bat box up there to help manage mosquitoes. And then we are putting in, we've been putting in some, we have a Western screech owl box. And then in the back, we put in a, a barn owl box. So we're trying to bring in some more balance too with the um, wildlife and wild predators. Okay. What is the bat box controversy? I've never heard of that before. There's only mild controversy around bats, people thinking bats are vectors. Um, you know, in light of what's happening right now too, there are theories around that kind of, you know, between bats and viruses, but truthfully it's, it's, you know, I think vermin, the idea of vermin, bats are obviously an incredibly important part of the ecosystem. They're incredibly important when it comes to um, pollinating and just, you know, and pest control. Um, and Los Angeles actually does have like a pretty healthy population of bats. Uh, and bats can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes a day, a single bat. So they're a really important part of vector control. That's awesome. I just want to uh, share a couple of shout outs from uh, Claire Evans, who was also a homeowner on the garden Aww. tour past, and I know a good friend of yours and design client, um, and Isabel Osgood Roach is also watching and says, so cool. yeah. hi. <laughs> um, we had some questions about the chamomile and I just want to kind of clarify, it's not native and Correct. We, we are courting controversy on the poppy hour by um, <laughs> not uh, driving a hard line with having to feature 100% native residential gardens because we want to show people that you can incorporate um, natives and and there's a reason why you're growing non-native chamomile. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Well, I, the sort of philosophy around my garden is a combination of at the bare minimum plants that want to thrive, mostly natives, but definitely a combination of medicinals, herbs, edibles, um, really functional plants that are both aesthetically functional, but also have like a nutritional component and also a spiritual component. And, you know, I mean, this field brings me incredible joy and requires zero maintenance and is not taking up otherwise uh, square footage that would be occupied by a native plant. But I also have a philosophy with the garden. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit, I like to see who kind of wins. I plant and what I'm kind of moving towards more and more is, is reducing the non-natives I have and replacing them with more natives. But there are certainly many interfaces in the garden where natives and non-natives are coming together. And 
I think it's actually really fascinating to watch what happens, how the wildlife intersects with that, you know, the, the insects and the animals and how we as a family interact with that. Yeah, I think that this broaches on kind of one of the critical topics of our of our community, which is we know that native plants um, support native insects in a much more powerful way than non native plants. And yet we're human beings with our own, you know, edible and medicinal uh, kind of habits in these times. So um, I think it's a really interesting mix. Will you tell us about your arbor and what native vine is growing, completely covering your entrance? Yes. Okay. So uh, the arbor, and then I'll switch views. We have this big long gate here, um, which was just a metal gate that's similar to the um, door right there. And then we put in this big, pardon my hand, this big arbor, um, which then connects to a shade structure in the back and planted the Calistegia, Macrostegia, the Anacapa uh, Morning Glory, Anacapa Pink Morning Glory. And basically um, started with three one gallon pots. And uh, that was probably four years ago. And over time, it's just completely um, covered the, the gate. And then it's just kind of a process of seeing what happens. I mean, right now it's, it's in its growth phase. So it's really um, verdant and flowering and beautiful and creates tons of habitat for lizards and birds and rats, which is a thing. Um, but it's also then coming together with our non-native passion fruit vine. And so they come together basically right over the staircase that leads into our backyard. And they're sort of having a, I mean, they're living, they're cohabitating right now. And we control the passion fruit a lot more than we have to control the, um, the morning glory, which does get a little bit kind of, uh, it's supposed to be evergreen, but it definitely does get a little uh, shabby in the hot uh, summer and into the fall. And so now we're looking at your edible zone. So I, what I love about your garden is it's a sloping backyard and you've terraced it into multiple zones. And something that I really wanted to touch on with you is that as a parent of a young child, you're, you decided not to go with, you know, needing a traditional lawn. Um, and you have all these zones. And how does that work for your kiddo? Yes, that's one of my favorite things. Uh, you know, I talk to different people, different clients who are, you know, considering doing landscaping in their yard and they have this traditional idea that with kids, what they really need is a big patch of grass to run around on and for you to put your, you know, your plastic play structure. But in fact, kids love nature and they will be infinitely more fascinated staring into a patch of flowers that's covered in ladybugs than, you know, a plastic slide in the middle of a grass field. And what I like to do with my garden, what I like to do with my clients' gardens, because it's actually um, universally appealing, whatever age you are, is to have lots of nooks and crannies and basically little micro habitats where you're going to see lots of different uh, plants. You're gonna see a lot of different um, insects. You're gonna have a different experience in every corner and every corner is also going to have its own transformation throughout the year. And kids, I mean, that's, it's, it's magic. <laughs> and kids love magic and kids love nature. And that's where they kind of really connect with their own imagination and it's, it's significantly more entertaining to watch too than watching your kid fall off a play structure. I love parks and I love uh, playgrounds and my kid loves those too, but they don't have a uh, buy-in after a couple of years. And I think with a garden, your kid grows and matures with those plants and 
buys into the different relationships that they can have with those as they mature. So we have a few more minutes and there's just so much to talk about oh, yes. um, in your garden. So let's see, should we get into the native plants that you have around for medicinal purposes? Yes. yes. Okay. So I, I just want to touch on a couple of things in the, in the sort of edible, this is what we call the farm corner which is mostly non-native edibles, but we also have, have like our collection of medicinals, our mugwort, California mugwort, which is in the corner and kind of just pops up all over the place, which has multiple medicinal um, values, but also has a strong spiritual component um, for indigenous people. Um, I am not an expert on medicinals. I think there's a lot of incredible uh, indigenous herbalists in California that people should give their money. You are cutting out. We have our- But I do find great value and learning. Oh, oh, I would say go back to the middle. This is our wonderful constraint that we're working with um, for Zoom is <laughs> endless issue of where where people have good reception. Um, can you talk about the concrete that we're seeing? Um, I know that you, you know, repurposed yeah. that. So a lot of the broken concrete that you see that we used for paving and that we also used to rebuild um, the steps that lead into our garden. Uh, and they also make the bridges on our swale came from the concrete that was here before we had one of those kind of typical gardens where or plots of land where uh you know two-thirds of it were paved and so we broke up and removed a lot of it but then repurposed much of it for the paving and urbanite's been quite popular design wise it's had its moment i'm personally kind of over it but it was a great way to to you know, save money on um, hardscaping material. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's pan around. We have to kind of wrap it up in the next few minutes. Yes. Let's, let's pan around. Let's show, you know, there's the shade zone. And um, I just love all the little microclimates that you've created. Um, I think if you stand still for a minute, the Van Gogh-esque uh, uh, video feed will uh, sort itself out and become clear. You know, this, it's, I love the like the, the feel of this landscape. You can just tell how kind of warm it is, and it's it's also got it's like a timely like the the arbor with stuff growing on it gives it that like mature California look, which I think is is really great. I would say one thing too about you know this is obviously a sort of six-year-old garden, but as soon as we planted, as soon as we put anything in the ground and just kind of reshaped it, put in the swale, put in uh, water capture, um, you know, we have uh, rain capturing um, systems uh, and just did these initial things. Uh, it was, infinitely it was ple pleasurable to be in the garden from the get-go you know and that's something that i try to impart to folks you know it gets better every year but there's never been a year where i've wished that it was more you know it's always been really fun to be here i think something i wanted to bring up before we um end our our time with you and Please stay on, by the way, uh, for the end. Our tradition is to bring everyone up, uh, bring friends up for a Zoom social um, at the very end. So we'll get to hear from you again at the end of the show. But um, I think just we, we had been chatting uh, the other day about kind of the concept of wellness and the connection between gardening and um, wellness. And I know since you own, you started a gym uh, called Everybody, I know that's something you think a lot about. Um, I'd love for you to share your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, yes. The concept of wellness has definitely been co-opted by like a whole industry that 
sort of sells us this idea that to be well, we have to buy certain things and, you know, use certain products and stuff like that. And I think that it's actually, I think that's wrong. <laughs> um, I think that it's about community. Wellness is really around centered around community and access, uh, you know, uh, privilege and redistribution of privilege or using your privilege to create spaces that provide uh, more access. I mean, from a sort of environmental or naturalist perspective, you know, I have the privilege of owning a piece of land and my focus is creating habitat or creating a habitat that supports the wildlife of this area, um, you know, creating a carbon sink, reducing my carbon footprint, but then also um, sharing that information with other people who have the privilege to own land. Uh, and then also just having more conversations around the connection between environmental justice and social justice and our access um, because of that. Uh, it's, it's, I think that people don't see the connections and part of the work that I do is about bridging those connections and um, providing access not only for plants and animals, but also for people, which is the, the gym component, which is everybody is a radically inclusive gym and wellness center that um, is really modeled around providing health and wellness to everybody, um, regardless of your socioeconomic status, your race, your gender, your um, sexual orientation, and all of those also feed into, you know, whether or not you have access to a piece of land that you can put native plants into, they're all connected. Thank you, Lake. I feel like the more we can emphasize how interconnected everything is, um, the better off we'll be. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And um, I think I think we have to move on. I would love to continue this conversation, um, but we wanna hear from Charlie. Um, so thank you so much and stick around for the end, please. My pleasure, thank you. I'll definitely stick around and um, answer any questions I might jump on the chat if there's if I can if there's any questions that people have I know that we didn't we only got to see a tiny bit but I love talking about this stuff yeah thank you so much like that was absolutely uh it's such a great garden I I can't wait to see it myself in person someday when it's safe to do so um and that's a really interesting way to to close out your tour and it, it it's making me think a lot of ideas about our next conversation um but I want to pause for a second I don't know if you guys can hear I'm at Theodore Payne Foundation in the sales yard right now. We're, we're still open um, for, you know, for staff only. Uh, and the birds are just going crazy right now. I don't know if any, if everyone can hear that. There's a humming, there's multiple species of hummingbirds flying around and it's really pretty enchanting right now. Um, so yeah, the, the little things right now are, are pretty amazing. And the birds just living, living in the Theodore Payne sales yard are, are uh, kind of blowing my mind right now. So yeah. Um, I'm excited for our next uh, guest tonight. He's a, a good friend of mine. We actually were on the same, we're kind of like next to, head offices next to each other at UCLA and we became good buddies. Um, and he's got a very interesting story, which we'll get into. Um, so it's Dr. Charlie De La Rosa. Um, I'll give a quick little preamble that his job is the uh, natural lands manager at San Diego Zoo Global. And we'll talk about actually what he does, but he's, he's done a lot of things throughout his career. Um, and has just a very interesting uh, perspective on nature and the human touch with nature and actually incorporating a lot of those seeing, seeing things, uh, the interconnectedness of things and how economies and ideas and society all um, influence, you know, ultimately what we do to the planet. So I think we'll have an interesting conversation today. Charlie, welcome, Dr. Charlie De La Rosa. Thanks for having me. Yeah, totally. So um man where do we start charlie there's a lot lot to start with here but um why don't we why don't we start with like kind of your background and how you grew up because you had an interesting childhood that'll kind of set the stage for um for what you're doing professionally now sure um well i was born in northeastern Pennsylvania, northwestern pennsylvania but um i spent most of my childhood in costa rica my dad's a biologist my mo mom and dad are both biologists 
And uh, we moved down there when I was six to, um, my dad was building a field station at the time in the Northwestern province in Guanacaste. And um, so we lived uh, without electricity for three years. Uh, we were on the field station about an hour away from anything um, in the middle of the tropical dry forest uh, for about four years. And um, then I lived in Monteverde for uh, a year and uh, started high school in, in San Jose. So um, after that, uh, moved, uh, moved back to the States and uh, I went to college at the University of Florida. I, I, didn't study, um, I didn't study biology at the time. I was trying to get away from the family business and uh, ended up majoring in uh, psychology and German. Uh, had a focus in uh, neurobiology and developmental biology. I was really interested in sort of the brain and stuff. And, uh, and then when I graduated, I realized I didn't want a professional career in any of those things. And so I started slogging it out in, uh, in technician level positions doing uh, invasive species management. I got a, a break, um, an invitation to come out to Catalina Island and I worked out there for 40 years and that was sort of the start of everything. Yeah, and I think that's, I, we didn't know each other then, but that's when our circles kind of started to intersect um, your work on Catalina and my work um, doing, uh, ooh, my just things just got very dark on my screen all of a sudden, um, and my work in conservation at that same time. Um, so yeah, Charlie, uh, of course, was steeped in, in biology growing up and then had this very physically kind of hands-on experience with managing nature on Catalina, like you were doing invasive species management and climbing up canyons and, and doing all that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I, I started off doing invasive plant management. That was kind of the, um, well, actually, I, I, my first position out there was, was working on the Fox Recovery Project. And, um, and so if, if you guys know the, um, the Channel Islands, six of the eight Channel Islands have uh, endemic uh, subspecies of fox there, and uh, Catalina's uh, nearly died out in the late uh, nine, or, uh, yeah, late nineties, early two thousands, uh, from an outbreak of canine distemper virus. And so I worked on that project for a little while, trapping foxes, cleaning traps, um, and then I lateraled into an invasive plant level, uh, in place, invasive plant technician position, and. Um, Ended up uh, working with that, doing some environmental education work, and um, running the field operations for the invasive plant program out there. Forty-two thousand acres, so it's a uh, we were working on sixty different species, and um, and then I also worked on uh, the mule deer management program. And so, so it's interesting because yeah, yeah, good segue. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm holding up a plant right now. Can you guys bring bring it up so I can show it? Um, in case you missed the intro, I started by describing Dendromecon harfordii. And um, this is a plant from the Channel Islands that Charlie encountered during those days. And I think we should just jump into this right now, Charlie. We still have things to get to in your career and your professional life, but Charlie is uh, a hunter and he's done a lot of that throughout his career and on Catalina, right? You, you hunted on Catalina. I wonder if we could just quickly kind of talk about how you view the ethics of hunting in the context of land conservation and habitat conservation? Yeah, so really briefly, I was a, an adult onset hunter. I, um, I started on Catalina specifically because of, uh, I was really interested in slow food and whole food, you know, that kind of the omnivores dilemma type stuff. Um, I was really concerned about uh, industrial agricultural and, and um, especially like industrial meat production. And, um, and because I was, I mean, to be honest, as a kid, I was raised on sort of adventure books and adventure stories. And, and it just seemed to me like a really tactile and um, really intense way to, a new way to interact with, with the outdoors. And um, so I, uh, Catalina has a population of mule deer that were introduced in the 1930s for sport hunting by the, um, by the owners of the island at the time. And, um, they're currently managed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife or considered by the Department of Fish and Wildlife as a native California game species. They are from California. They were brought out from California populations. And so this is an interesting kind of tie into this concept of native and non-native. They are native to California, 
uh, on Catalina, they're they are quite destructive. Um, so well, you, the Dedromicon is a really interesting right. example. Yeah, it's, it's the converse, and and they this this which is native to Catalina, the Dendromicon harfordii island bush poppy, is not native to LA, but it, it's a great garden plant, and I do recommend you use it. It's very drought tolerant. Shout out to our sponsors, um, and uh, but yeah, there the the native plant was consumed by the mule deer, which were native but introduced. So it it gets really confusing and complicated, and and that's kind of what what makes this fun to to talk about. Um, yeah, we would call that deer deer ice cream um, because it's one of the first species that the deer would actually target. Uh, you know, evolving on the Channel Islands means that on Catalina, for example, the the largest. Uh, herbivore that it would have been native herbivore that it would have been exposed to as a ground squirrel, and so um, you can imagine that the it would kind of relax its chemical defenses and relax its other defenses that you know other plants that were raised on the mean streets of the mainland would have uh, would have evolved in response to herbivory, and so the deer would definitely target those and they turn them into topiary sculpture. The ones that were large enough to survive were the ones that were taller than the head height of a deer and the deer would, would browse them up into this lollipop shape. So it's, oh it's pretty interesting. They shape the phenology as well as the distribution of that species. And you can imagine that, you know, any seedling would be just toast. So there's not as much seed, seed recruitment and it definitely puts the population in peril. Yeah, I really want to see photos of the topiary uh, island bush pop. I'm curious, like a, a lollipop, a deer, deer, deer prune, yeah, a Sarah Rate would be a good one to just a shout out to the, the queen of Catalina botany. Yeah, hey Sarah, hope you're mm -hmm. hope you're checking this out at some point, either now or in the future. Um, yeah. So, all right, well, you, go ahead, just, just to just to wrap it up, um, I I started working on we on Catalina we would manage the deer population through sport hunting, and that was the that was the tool that we have. It's a really imperfect tool because um, sport hunting in the United States has been a, a historically a very successful way to recover populations of game species. You know, white-tailed deer and turkeys in the 20th century, in the early 20th century were, you know, practically extirpated from market hunting. And then through, by instituting these like, you know, tags and bag limits and seasons and uh, eliminating market hunting, then, you know, it just, it brought them back from the verge of extinction. And so that that's a very difficult tool to actually reduce a population, but that was what we did. And that was sort of my my baptism by fire into the hunting community, working with hunters. I'd have, you know, I'd get to drive them around the island for three days and have a captive audience to talk about biology, island conservation, and all of these different topics. And I also learned yeah. just a ton in terms of the skills that go into it. So something that's, that's really yeah. important. I mean, we should we need to we should hold the thought of hunting and and also it being a, a major kind of economic driver of conservation. Like, let's hold that thought. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. Um, but now we need to jump to your dissertation, which is I think the, the craziest thing that I've known <laughs> about. Um, where you worked down in Mexico and you you befriended a community of um, of ranchers, basically, uh, and and you can talk more to the specifics of this, but. What is the cow GoPro system? And, and just, I mean, maybe what what did you do? Like, this is a pretty crazy thing, and people I think would be interested to hear. So how, you, I, how you spent many years of your life? <laughs> when I pub when I went to publish it, I, I uh, the reviewers told me that I couldn't call it cow pro anymore because it wouldn't appeal to wildlife biologists. So I called it the uh, let me see if I remember the acronym. It was the video and uh, let's see video and co coordinated automated system and anyway the acronym comes out to vacam so i still got to tie a, a cow pun into it vaca and, <laughs> and cam yeah. like camera nice. so basically um for for my my phd work i i, I did my phd at ucla at, in the uh, uh, department of ecology and evolutionary biology and um so for my dissertation work i um uh, i wanted to look at uh, traditional cattle ranches, low kind of low density cattle ranches in tropical dry forest in southeastern Sonora in Mexico. So my advisors had a, a field site down there and I was able to go down and check it out and um, basically the, it sort of ballooned into this big animal um, behavior 
and uh, you know community ecology project. And in order to find out what the cows were eating while they're ranging around in the forest, like basically functionally like uh, like any large herbivore, it's a it's a relatively intact environment that they were moving around in and encountering plants with this like dizzying array of you know, chemical defenses and mechanical defenses and stuff, and they're eating stuff. And so I was really interested in knowing what, uh, you know, like what they were eating and, and in what frequency related to the, the diversity of, the, um, of those plants in the environment. And so I took cow, uh, GoPro cameras and I extensively hacked them to be able to take um, 20 second videos every half hour throughout the course of about a week. And, um, and I put them into little pelican cases that are about this big with their experimental batteries and VHF transmitting you know, equipment and stuff. And I put them onto the, um, these little bell collars that the, cat, the ranchers would use to locate their cows. And then they would turn on and they'd film the bottom of the cow's jaw. And the nice thing about cows is that you know, between 50 and 90% of their daylight hours are spent munching on stuff. And so I got about 5,000 videos of cow behavior and GPS track logs at the same time. And um, anyway, um, long story short, yeah, it was, uh, it was a really interesting um, experience. And I did live in a, a small ranching community for a long period of time. And the thing that I came away with um, was that, yeah, at a, like any large herbivore, cows are affecting forest tree community diversity and, and species distributions and stuff. But when you when you zoom out, when you when you look at it from the aerial photo level at the forest, there it's still there. There's still green. And if you look a little further south into into uh, across the border into Sinaloa, uh, there's a lot of that same tropical dry forest that's gone. And what's the major difference in Sinaloa? There's, they're cutting down the forest for uh, the burn, you know, burning it for charcoal or cutting it down for agriculture, cutting it down to plant buffalo grass and other grass species to enhance their cattle. And up in Sonora, there are, there are two things. There's uh, the top down, like there's a, a basically a um, protected area that the, the best equivalent up here would be like a, um, a lease or, um, you know, it, it, it's basically a protected area where people live and they're allowed to do certain things, uh, but they're not allowed to clear cut the forest. And then there's a bottom up component to it that has to do with the fact that there are multi-generational families that are maintaining the same properties. And so I, I think that that's really interesting because that's a nice little microcosm of conservation in the world. You've got laws that keep people from doing stuff that they otherwise would do, like cut down all the forests to strip mine or to, you know, for uh, logging or whatever. And then you've got these values and traditions that also maintain these, the, you know, uh, the biodiversity or any of these other things that were metrics that we, we uh, use yeah. to place value on places. Yeah, totally. So let's keep these threads in mind and, and we'll move on to, to your current job. And, and I want to, we'll have to be kind of quick because I want to save some time for, try to synthesize some of this stuff and, and um, think, think about what it means in context of where we're headed as a society um, in our approach to nature. Um, so, so now your job now, as, after you completed your dissertation is uh, the national, natural lands manager at San Diego Zoo. So what does that actually mean? So it's a it's a fairly new position. The zoo um, has two natural area natural properties that they are responsible for for managing, and uh, one the only one when I when I started the job uh, is a 900 acre coastal sage scrub preserve that's actually part of the whole uh, safari park lease property, and so it's in North County um, in uh, near Escondido. I live in Escondido now, and. Um, and it's a really interesting area. It's uh, it's in the San Pasqual Valley, which is a for, it's an agricultural preserve, and um, and it has uh, you know like no threats from habitat destruction. It's been set aside for conservation in perpetuity, uh, but there are you know like the major threats to biodiversity have to do with climate change and with invasive species, and so those are the things that we are we're trying to front end there. 
the other property is a donation that we got from uh, from a zoo donor, and it's a uh, 650 acre parcels in uh, the foothills of the Cuyamaca Mountains near Wisconsin, and that's a new thing, and and we're pretty excited to get started working on it. And so, what is what is a you know managing a place like that actually entail? Like, are you? I know you're doing some like invasive species work. Are you are you putting anything back? Are you planting anything there, or is it pretty intact already? So the the idea of restoration is a really like interesting, sometimes fraught concept. Right now, what we did is a prior prioritization. Um, you know, we we first we figured out like what are the species that we're trying to protect, that we're trying to keep from going extinct or be locally ex extirpated in this area. And then what are the greatest threats to those species? The, the, um, I think the, the way that a lot of uh, that restoration is frequently done is you look at what's native and you look at what's non-native and then you say like, okay, well, these are the worst of the na non-natives and then we try to get rid of those. Um, I'm a little less interested in that approach because it's, it doesn't, it's not goal oriented. The idea that I think that what I want to do is manage for sustainability. I want to manage, I want to smooth out the natural ups, the ups and downs of extinctions and, and proliferations of, of different species. And basically just try and preempt any kind of like major disasters. And the way we do that is I think a little different but from just saying native good, non-native bad. Um, so the main thing that we're doing is trying to, to create areas that are free from particular invasive species that we know that we have evidence, correlational evidence and direct evidence um, and observational evidence that they're going to affect, they're the, the, the biggest potential threats to our priority species. So um, we're trying to create good habitat for coastal cactus wrens. So this is a, and, and, um, it's a disjunct population of cactus wrens that lives in, in coastal Southern California and Baja California. Uh, California gnat catchers are a federally, uh, federally listed species that we have. And we're trying to create a uh, habitat that's going to maintain these stable big populations of these, of these species. So, I'm sure our viewers who, who are mainly gardeners and plant enthusiasts, they've, they've dealt with this, they've, they've dealt with what you do on, on their own um, smaller scale, flights changing here. Um, but to some extent, you're kind of like gardening on 800 acres, um, you know, with, right? I mean, is that, is that a dumb way to think of it or, or? I don't think that's a dumb way to think of it at all. I think that's exactly correct. Um, conservation is really an endeavor that's by people, for people, because of people, and people are woven into every potential aspect of it. And I think that it's really valuable for us. To, I think that what we need is a, a kind of like a perspective shift on, on how we, we see conservation and the goals that we set for ourselves. I think a lot of people um, get very comfortable using these sort of shortcuts of, um, you know, like that there's, that there's one ecosystem that is the thing that we want to try and restore to and manage for. And that ecosystem is populated by native species and everything occurs harmoniously. Well, a small parcel that's like re that's basically restored to 1491 within a larger context of non-permeable sur surfaces and invasive, uh, you know, degraded habitat and all this other stuff. It's just, it's not, uh, the world has changed. The world's moved on. And so I think that we need to make a lot of compromises that are, um, they're not so painful when you think, when you change your goals, when you think about the, the overarching goal, which should be sustainability and smoothing out, reducing the number of extinctions yep. that happen and reducing the, um, the potential for these ecological perturbations that, are, that, that result in lower, lower biodiversity in the long run. Totally. Um, I think, um, yeah, along those lines, um, we talked earlier a little bit about, um, you know, how, how do you sharing the, that message and convincing people? And and I think uh, Lake brought up a, a really interesting point about privilege. There, it is very much a privileged conversation to, to talk about these things. Um, and you know, sitting here as as we are <laughs> discussing, kind of to to what some someone who's struggling to feed themselves or keep 
their family sheltered uh, would consider a very esoteric and maybe not that important um, goal. And I, you must have brushed up against that in your experiences down in Mexico. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit like subsistence ranchers um, who are just trying to kind of scrape by, how do you share this idea of, you know, this privileged idea, which, and I'm glad that people with privilege are pushing this idea, which is that we need to live in harmony with nature and preserve what's left of biodiversity. How do you approach that subject? Um, and how did you approach that subject when, in, down in Mexico? Well, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, you're, you're touching on, on the, the big like overarching question. The thing that, that keeps me up at night is, you know, like how are we going to create sustainable systems, you know, with a growing human population and with, with no signs of real like societal change. I'm, I'm, I'm a pragmatist, like generally, I like to look at what we have what are what what are the basic sort of like pieces that we have and components that we have and what can we do with them? What's the how can we like get the ball moving forward? And basically, like there are major compromises that we need to make. Um, so in in Mexico, like you, you brought up the, um, you know, like how do I talk to ranchers about like conservation? I was I was working in a in a conservation area um, that had a nucleus uh, a protected area that's that's managed by a really awesome organization called Nature and Culture International and they have they have properties uh, mostly in South America and this Mexican property as well and um, and that area is cattle free it's people uh, there are no people living in it and it's made made up of small branches that, that the, um, the N NGO purchased and I think to a lot of people there, when they, they, they see land that's not under production, they don't, um, it seems it's valueless because what they've seen, I mean, the idea of purchasing a property is a little weird in a scenario where it's, it's com communally used, even though there are people that own it. And that, that guy, that rancher, he took the money and you know he was able to buy a house in some other place and his family's fine. But there are other people that are using it for non-timber forest products. They're harvesting uh, ch wild chili peppers. They're harvesting Mexican jumping beans and selling them at market. Um, you know that, and so if those those opportunities are taken away, then um, then that's a that that's a lowering their standard of living. And so basically, the the challenge that NCI that Nature and Culture International is is confronting head on. And that I think other uh, conservation organizations need to confront is like how do we recover economically and culturally some of the value that we're taking away from these communities, you know, um, and that's super important. So what I, I, I there's a particular conversation that I was remembering with a rancher uh, when we were talking before, and where he was asking me about this because. That land, you know, he was asking me like, well, what, what's the value? What's the purpose of this land? Why do you just let it go fallow? And I said, we're not, we're ranching biodiversity. We, the, this company has come in and they bought that land and they're producing a product that people are willing to pay for. That, and the challenge is then to weave that economy back into the local community in some way. And I, I think that there's, that's a larger, that's a parable that applies to conservation as a whole for all communities and for LA, for San Diego, uh, for rural Mexico or anywhere, that if, it, if people can't get some value from it, ultimately they're not gonna care about it and they're not gonna support it in the voting booth and they're not gonna support it financially and it's not sustainable. Conservation land holding that's surrounded by a hostile community is not sustainable, not yeah. in the long term. And, and so, so we might need to embrace this idea that um, conservation, uh, for better or worse, you know, we're, it's kind of a human decision to, to engage in it, to conserve nature. And, and you can do that on many scales. You can do that in your yard at home. You can do that um, at the voting booth, as, as we suggested. Not a political show, but we might, you know, <laughs> I will say that there are differences, um, major differences politically on how conservation issues are handled. Um, and, yeah. this, and, and it basically, we as a society and a culture need to make the decision that this is a really important thing and find ways to give value 
throughout the whole world in our own communities and, and further abroad. And um, as we're wrapping up, we're gonna open up soon to everyone, but as always with every Poppy Hour, we're gonna end with a question and uh, we're all gonna try to answer it. We'll try to answer it kind of quickly tonight because we're running out of time. And Lake, if you're still on, I'd love to have you join, um, join for this. So the question uh, I'm gonna pose to everyone this evening is, as the world approaches 10 billion people, what needs to change so that humans can live in greater harmony with the natural world? Who wants to start? Margaret? Sure. Um, so I think that the way late capitalism is functioning is just not tenable. Um, so I think our lives, I think what this pandemic is really showing us is that our lives have to slow down. They can slow down, um, although there's major adjustments. And um, I think that we just have to really clarify our goals kind of to Charlie's point. And I think we've lost touch with, you know, what really matters, which is that we need clean air, clean water, biodiversity, some room to roam, uh, just as human beings. And everyone on the planet definitely needs to have that. So I think that our economy and the way we live our lives probably needs to shift a lot. We probably need to be more local. Um, maybe traveling is like really special it's like a treat or for very important reasons um I don't know those are things I was thinking about lifestyle changes especially in our privileged western uh first world situations we've certainly had some of those recently um I'll go next um I, I think that this idea of the world is our garden and and some of those gardens are completely undesigned and as wild as, as your backyard, you know, as, as the completely wild and un, untamed and, and we should cherish those gardens and make sure that they're protected and they're not, uh, they're not changed. Some are totally designed and some of those designs incorporate nature back in, in particularly in our urban, urban environments. And we think creatively and out of the box, um, think vertically and, and you know, build nature, moving up buildings, and um, and then we have all all spaces in between where um, where there are different kind of levels of of use that that we then can um, you know try to build sort of a mesh that surrounds the whole world and keeps the nature intact. And it, I do think it starts in our cities, um, and so I hope you know. Plant, plant some native plants in your garden. That's, I guess, that's what I'm telling everybody. Um, but yeah, I think we might, we need to realize that there is no binary, binary anymore. There is no out there and in here. It's all one, one system that talks and communicates and interacts uh, with itself. So let's think about it like that and let's treat it like that. And I think that might help us live in greater harmony with, with our planet. And also I want to, I, I think what Margaret said is very true that the coronavirus, um, has given us a roadmap for what it might look like to be much more um, sustainable in our use of resources. So, uh, Charlie, what are you thinking? What's your answer to this? Um, the the phrase that keeps running through my mind is that the perfect can't be the enemy of, of good. Um, that we we need to start getting comfortable with making with. with I think that culturally we we really love extremes. We love like being all the way on one end of the spectrum or, or the other. We need to start meeting up in the middle a little bit more. So I think uh, the environmental movement in general um, will be more successful if we start making recognize that um, people need to be woven into and integrated into everything. I think wilderness has huge value. Personally, I love being in a place that is, you know, where, where I can feel small where I can and look out on the landscape and, and feel like I'm one small piece of a much larger thing, as opposed to, you know, a place that's, that's completely altered and dominated by human activity. But you have to recognize that, that that's a value that I have. And that value isn't always shared by other people. 
And I think at the same time as we're trying to change those values and like promote the, what we think are more sustainable and better values, we also need to make compromises and we need to make sure that people feel like they're welcome and they're integrated into, into our, our world. And, and I think that um, for me, a lot of like the tactile experiences that I, that I have in nature have just bound me closer to it. You know, foraging and, and hunting and fishing, you know, where sustainable and in a respectful way can be really valuable ways. And the organizations like uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership are bipartisan, you know, like bringing people on both sides of the aisle and pushing for uh, finding that middle ground that is, we don't want to see it turned into a parking lot. And that's a huge, that's a very powerful thing. So I think that that's the, the way of the future. And uh, we need to think about very, very hard about the way that um, our ethic and our values could be perceived by other people who don't share them or other people from the different economic spectrum and things like that. Yeah, totally. Um, let's move on to Lake. Lake, um, your garden was amazing, first of all. Second of all, I'd love to hear your take on this because I think I think something I'm sure you've thought about before. And you are on mute, so. I will unmute myself. Yes, I think in order for to wrap my brain around it, I have to kind of contextualize it in what I know and, and my experience and um, I think what this requires more than anything is the folks who do have privilege, economic, racial, um, political, we have to buy in on the level of, you know, what, what, how we define and um, showcase wealth when it comes to like a home, uh, the traditional look of that is not only is it about like putting in plants that have no business being there, it's also about like preventing any wild to come in, including water, including rain. We, we come up with all these systems to have all of this water and rain wash away from our property and down the sewer. And I think even just like changing people's perspectives on that and um, moving people more towards a stewardship mentality the people who can afford to make these big transformations. I would never go to anyone who has less than me and demand that they spend money on stuff that's not within their budget and doesn't make sense to them. I'm more I'm interested in, and, and by nature of being a landscape designer, you, you know, we're automatically working with people who have a certain amount of um, income to have, you know, privilege to, to spend that money. And so I'm really interested in getting them to, take their personal responsibility and making sure that their piece of land is um, polluting less, that their piece of land is uh, regenerating the watershed. And I think local shifts in mindset does ultimately build more towards a greater um, respect and then also responsibility for uh, the larger systems that we buy into and, and the new capitalism. I mean, I totally agree with Margaret that we are not in a sustainable place and it's not even really serving the most privileged. Um, you know, um, we have to buy into a new uh, system. And I think, you know, the, the positive upshot of that is that it's actually like an incredibly wonderful, beautiful, exciting and rewarding thing to have a native habitat garden. And, you know, it doesn't take too much to kind of reintroduce yourself to the wonder that's available on your little piece of land. You're here. <laughs> um, I agree with that. Um, so I think the last person to, to give his uh, prediction of, of how we'll live in harmony with 10 billion people live in harmony with nature is Philip. Yes, thank you, Evan. Um, yeah, it's definitely something I have been thinking about um, since before you asked this question. Um, and so I think it's really clear that in a, in a world with 10 billion people, I mean, really in a world with 
our current population. Um, it's, it's not going to be enough to simply reduce the impact that we're having on the planet. Um, we need to really fundamentally shift our way of thinking, way of being, um, and we need to start having a positive impact on the earth. Um, I think we need to be carbon positive, um, both on a personal level um, and also societally and globally. Um, and we need to stop thinking of ourselves as separate from nature um, and sort of seeing nature as some sort of resource that we can endlessly mine and consume um, until it no longer exists. Um, and at the same time that we like see ourselves as nature, we also of course need to recognize our responsibility um, that we have um, on this planet to, um, even, if it's, even if it's for the selfish reasons of just like sustaining our own species and quality of life, um, we really need to recognize how interconnected we all are. Um, and I think that with this current pandemic, we're seeing more than ever um, how connected we are. And, um, you know, I think we need to harness that for positive uh, means and really, um, you know, shift this um, so that we can support uh, 10 billion people on this planet um, and, and actually live, you know, a good quality of life where we can, you know, have the biodiversity that we all crave and, you know, are able to enjoy the birds that um, I'm still enjoying um, over Zoom. Yeah, they're chirping, those theater pain birds. Um, yeah, well, well, there we are, all, all up on our soapboxes. Um, <laughs> Stay up uh, on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in um, to this week of Poppy Hour. Next week, it, we are going to get way out there. It's very exciting. We're going to talk about Datura, Rightei, and uh, we're going to, well, first, we'll start with Casa, Apoc Casa Apocalyptica, which is, of course, an amazing garden. And we're going to try to go deep with them and, and get behind their their thoughts and ideas and what drives drives uh, such a wonderful garden. And then we're gonna go really out there with Datura Raidii and, and uh, its use as a shamanistic medicine and a spiritual medicine event. Hamilton Morris, who has a TV show called Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. Uh, David Shorter, who is a professor at UCLA, the apology department. It should be a very fascinating discussion. So I hope that you all will tune in to Poppy Hour next week. Thanks for joining us this week. Margaret, any parting words of wisdom? Uh, no, just thank you to you all. And I've been bringing up some uh, some friends uh, so we can go into our little uh, Zoom social moment at the end here. Um, and I just really want to thank everyone for tuning in, sharing their thoughts and comments and joining us on this experimental Zoom interactive TV show thing that we're doing. <laughs> um, I'm having fun. I hope everyone else is too. Yes. Oh, here we are. If anyone <laughs> wants to give their response to uh, how to live harmoniously with 10 billion people on the planet. I'd I think it's, com I was gonna say, I think it's complex, you know? I uh, where there are, you know, certainly issues with, comp you know, uh, uh, situations with compromise. But I also think, um, I also think that, uh, you know, for me, it's God bless the, the activists and the extremists on the environmental side, because they have made a huge difference. I mean, they just helped, uh, you know, uh, with the Supreme Court saying that we're allowed to have clean water. And this is an administration that is trying to take that away. And yes, we don't want to get political, but I, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, we have to. We're in a political situation where they're trying to take away our, our, our wildlands, our water, our air. And I mean, so it's, it's under assault. And whereas we're going to need the diplomats who are part of this uh, fight, we're going to need the warriors. And, and so it's really great to see a whole different type of people 
that are involved but like yeah i'm 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 like a super supporter of like joaquin phoenix and jane fonda who are major warriors in this fight and they're not going to let up they're going to keep going and um and just i was part of the 350.org earth day and just to see all these young people who are going to be who are fighting for the environment who are going to to make a difference uh, it was very exciting and very hopeful. Thank you, Tuchos. Your video isn't showing, so we, but I know you um, are a member of the TPF community and have been attending every hour of coffee, every episode of Coffee Hour. So thanks I for your thoughts. Margaret, I think, you know, this is Yvette Martinez with the Metropolitan Water District. I think Tuchos is right on, and it was so wonderful to see lakes daughter um, in the garden today. Um, organizations like Metropolitan and DWP, we recognize that it's so important to engage our youth to make sure that they feel connected to nature and they appreciate nature. So we have a series of programs that we offer as young as kindergarten all the way to colleges and universities. And our hope is that um, students will be inspired, they'll want to go into careers, um, you know, and, and whether it be a water agency related to the environment. So for more information on our education programs, both CWP as well as Metropolitan, um, you can go on bewaterwise.com for more information. But absolutely, that's an important component. And I love hearing the birds in the background. Yeah. So relaxing. Mm -hmm. They're like so loud. Second. I know, right? <laughs> I'd like to second what Yvette said because, um, and hi, Yvette and hi. Teresa. Hi. Um, I, you know, one of the, you know, some of the conversation was uh, revolved around equity and how do you, how do you encourage communities that may not necessarily have, you know, this may not necessarily be a priority on their list, you know, transforming their turf because they're, especially right now, there's a lot of, you know, food insecurity issues, there's unemployment, and how do you keep this as, a, as an issue that's important or provide the resources to those communities so that they recognize that there is a connection to quality of life and the environment. And, and one of the ways I think that um, Metropolitan and Department of Water and Power have done so is, you know, uh, Metropolitan offers um, the California Friendly Landscape Training classes. So anybody can attend those. Um, and they offer those to all of their member agencies. So anyone could come to kind of learn about how that benefits them and they offer it in Spanish. Um, additionally, we've kind of stepped up one other level and now we are offering our hands-on workshops. So if somebody maybe has um, a very limited budget but really feels passionate about trying to make that landscape transformation, they could learn how, about how to do so themselves by participating in these workshops that are held at a residence they actually get to um, participate in the transformation over two days. Um, the workshops are roughly four hours and um, they walk away with a workbook that shows them how to do it as well so that they can follow along. And we've also got videos too. So we're trying to make sure that we provide that, that information to as many different you know, uh, community members as possible, regardless of what type of financial situation they have. I just like to say on like a broader environmental justice spectrum, um, you know, environmental justice and, and um, has always been led by, you know, predominantly working class indigenous people. It's not, you know, I mean, part of the conversation is like what colonization has, uh, you know, that's been a, a, a force of, you know, broadly taking away um, environmental health and access. And, you know, every environmental justice movement and labor movement has always been led by and for, um, you know, working class indigenous people and everything that, you know, we're doing or that I'm doing, I should say, is, is in an effort from a privileged perspective, but it is also honoring the work and the movements that have been existing for generations and for millennia of people trying to, you know, there's always been a strong relationship between 
people and their land. And when you live in an urban area and you're dealing with, you know, much less access um, and housing issues and stuff like that, the conversation is definitely altered. But, you know, I want to also just recognize that the environmental movement has always been by, for, and led by uh, working class indigenous uh, people. That's not true. It, it is true. <laughs> I mean, people with privilege and people throughout the, the history yeah. have, have been part of those movements too. But you can always, in any area, people who live there and who have lived there for a long time have an opinion on what they want to see happen with their land. They're not oh, without yeah. opinions. You know, they're not without yeah. feelings about what happens. And have often been left out of the conversation in kind of wider, broader environmental, envir environmentalist conversations. Right. I mean, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm a Kiowa and um, I, I grew up <laughs> around uh, environmental uh, activism because mm -hmm. of, of native, you know, native people and being aware. And the thing is, it's not just being aware of, of my nation, the Kiowa nation. But, you know, Native peoples for even when my grandfather would tell me growing up, him growing up, Native peoples have gathered together to, to fight for the environment for, you know, f for s centuries. I mean, this is, you know, uh, something that is vital to their identity. I mean, to our identity and who we are. So, uh, yeah, it has been. I mean, uh, it, and it always starts really... Uh, it's always it starts in a very small voice and by the time it's gotten larger then you've had like other people you know uh, taking credit for being the environmentalist but you're absolutely right it's been at a very ground level because they are directly working with and in touch with that land that's an interesting right. oh, and the I most would... impacted yeah I mean, yeah I mean, it's our, it's our identity. Um, it's, uh, it's, it identifies who we are. It's our, uh, it's our DNA, it's our religion, it's everything, it's our culture. Yeah, if I could add to that thread, I think what Charlie and I sort of were alluding to is this, um, this old school conservation, met, you know, thought that like you have the wilderness out there and that's just, pristine and humans don't touch it and interact with it and then we have our cities where we live and that's very anti-indigenous mindset obviously because many people were here interacting with landscapes of North America prior to 1492 um, and also I think it's detrimental to the movement of environmental conservation in general because it it creates this sort of sense that we're not these two environments are not connected and um so I hope that we can adopt a more humanistic approach to how we think about our relationship um, to the remaining, you know, deep wilderness places of the planet. Um, and I think that begin weirdly that sort of begins in the city. And and I, I I'm so excited to see all the uh, the folks from the various water uh, agencies. Like the work that they're doing is connecting people to the land in their in, in their local environment, which I, I just think is really, really cool. And um, I wish we got to see what Lake has done with her uh, water catchments and some of the things she's built into her landscape is they're pretty neat. Yeah, I would just add that I really appreciate um, bringing in indigenous perspective into this conversation. Um, thank you, Tuchis, and thank you, Lake. I think, um, I actually am, I'm, I'm a student at UC Irvine in grad school and ITA for a class called Art and Sustainability. And uh, I was able to bring in an essay by um, an indigenous scholar named Vanessa Watts, which was about this concept called place thought. Um, and if any, you know, I can uh, sort of send a link to Vanessa Watts website and you can find it. But um, just the idea kind of, thinking against the Cartesian view that like mind and body are separate and that we have this separate identity from landscape. And I think as Tuchis is pointing out, many indigenous peoples, um, 
you know, really perceived the really direct relationship of land and body and that mind and body and land are all really connected. And I think we can learn now in 2020, we as, you know, the people living on <laughs> in, in planet Earth um, from these very ancient indigenous perspectives. So I really appreciate you bringing that in. And I appreciate seeing everyone here in our Poppy Hour Social, including Evan's daughter and his wife, Abby. Hi, you want to say hi? Say hi. Hi. How's it going? Hey. hey. <laughs> We've been swimming in the pool in our backyard. We have a little like inflatable pool and listening to the talks. It's been a great combination. <laughs> Yep. We never talked. We never talked about how hot it was today. It's so hot today. Great time to water wisely in the heat, right? Early mornings or, or late evenings are the best times for watering. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. If you're if you're a, um, if you're a new native plant gardener, you know the biggest mistake you can say is like, oh man, it's it's really hot and it's like three in the afternoon. I'm just gonna I'm gonna water my plants right now. Don't do that. That's very bad. <laughs> um, I see Holly and Jeff on. How, how are you guys doing? Good. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> We're good. It's good to see everybody. Really nice to see you. I've I've missed your videos, Jeff. Oh, really? Um, Keep posting. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I should. I should. And Philip, you get the big hair award uh, for tonight. Thank you. Thank so. you. <laughs> it looks good. I thought I would get that. I'm working on it. I, I thought I would get it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Evan and I would share it. Yeah. <laughs> I know we were saying how, how we got spruced up for tonight. Mine, mine involved uh, Abby buzzing my head, which is <laughs> really easy for me to get a haircut. Zip. Um, Andrew, what's going on? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. <laughs> are you busy keeping the foundation uh, running while we're uh, doing poppy hour? Is that, you look very uh, <laughs> intently doing something. Yeah, I'm looking at my computer remotely, unfortunately. I better stop. It's a lot to do, right? <laughs> yeah, Andrew and I have been quite busy. Um, but it, this is actually like a really fun part of my job right now to do this poppy hour. It's, I kind of feel like it's fairly self-indulgent to just like talk to people that I find very interesting and, uh, you know, ponder nature and, and what it means to be a gardener. And, um, but it's, it's very reassuring to see all you guys here and, um, and get your perspectives on this. I, I, I'm excited. I think we're doing some fun stuff. Thanks Charlie for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it was a lot of fun I, and I really enjoyed our sort of like warm-up conversations too. Yeah, <laughs> we should have recorded those. We got really <laughs> out there on it this morning <laughs> as was I was good. as I was inflating Violet's pool at the same time and trying to uh, <laughs> parenting and working at the same time. Um, Charlie, how can they, how can people kind of uh, find out more about what you do at the zoo? Um, I don't, I don't have a program website right now. Um, you, I mean, definitely feel free to reach out to me directly through my email. I, there's a, I have a profile on the Institute for Conservation Research website. And um, so you can kind of read a little bit more about the program there. But right now, like it's, it's just restoration work. And, um, you know, like we don't have a, a a public interaction kind of component yet, but I'm trying to work our way into some of the zoo programming because I mean, the zoo has this incredible bullhorn. They have, you know, thousands of people in San Diego County and, and around the world that are listening very intently to their social media and to their, um, you know, other kind of like outputs. And, um, and so just kind of like, like telling the stories. So we were talking about this early, earlier. The the it's easy to tell the stories about places with jaguars and macaws and you know 
uh, giraffes and elephants and stuff. And sometimes like telling the stories about the chaparral and coastal sage scrub there, they, you have to, you know, take a little more time to, to, to really dig into them. And it's, it's tough when you're talking to an audience like what we've got here and everybody is like already drunk the Kool-Aid, you know, everybody's already all in. But there's so many people out there that, you know, in the summer they look out and they just see trash. There's, it's just junk, you know. And in the, you know, spring and uh, then they, they, they look for the wildflowers and then they go home. You know, and I think we can do better than that. We can get people more stoked. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we need to move beyond the super bloom selfie being the only like mass yeah but, point of interest and, but don't you know, hate on it too much because no it's, it's pretty cool that. i mean I, i'm not gonna hate on it i yeah. we just there, there's just an oh, article. i have such a hard time with the super bloom selfie all of the poppies oh, being yeah. crushed it's so I know. hard you know, so, i'm from the i'm from new york i used to be one of those people that you know not i didn't take super bloom selfies but i would say oh pretty it's spring and i want to go see in the summer but then once somebody explained to me what is happening in the summer with those dried up plants, the, all these different birds and stuff, then that got me really excited. Um, so I think it's just, it, I think it's also just information. I think people get into it once they just have information. I, ju I just have a hard time making people feel bad because they're, I mean, a lot of people that are going out to see these super blooms are, uh, you know, they're not, they're not people that are like really that have an intense relationship with the outdoors. This might be the one thing, you know, and that's another one of those like kind of compromises I think about. Like if we, if we wag our fingers at them too much, then we might, we might extinguish that little ember that's just started burning in someone, you know, you might, you might just snuff it out. Yeah, I think there, I mean, I think a lot about, cause you know, we're in a, I think things are shifting, but we're, we're, we've been in this cancel culture where it's all about shame. And we've been focusing a lot about shaming people right. and it's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't actually make people change their behavior. It just makes them change their audience or whatever it is. And right. so you can't give up on the messaging, but you do have to figure out how to get people um, to care more because and social media is, I mean, I'm looking forward to a um, post-internet world and maybe that'll happen in some, some way or some form. I mean, like, <laughs> it's more like out there idea but, or post-social media world, but it can't just be that you're, you know, that you just accept that people just destroy things in an effort to get a cute photo. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm I think fully again, on board with a post internet world, like, yeah, let's start that. <laughs> but I do think that information, if people know, yes. you know, that the, the fragility of these plants, I, I think a lot of people will understand and care, but then they're just people who just won't and, and, and who are destructive. And you have to, you have to take your precautions with those people. But mm -hmm. I think for the most part, a lot of people, you know they they don't know and once you tell them they're they understand mm -hmm. i think people yeah. really deep down inside want to understand they really do but they don't you know we don't they give do. them enough information and it's I the think, language that you use i think that matters a lot absolutely well, I, I think it's it's kind of you know i i mean i i love the super blooms but i think it's a little um it's kind of funny to me that people you know, wait like till this one time a year to go out to go see these plants when they are here in the urban area and you just have to foster it and you have to, you could have that Instagram picture in your front yard if you took out your turf and replaced it with California friendly plants or native plants, um, specifically native plants. Um, but people just don't associate that and they think of it as being a destination that they have to go to to experience versus something that they could create on their own property given that they have the space. It's not something that's unheard of, but it's that disconnection between that's something that belongs farther away and not here. And I think you have to kind of change that mindset. People have to recognize that there's this movement to bring back that urban, that native landscape to the urban environment. And it starts with 
every single homeowner making that conscious choice to replace turf and put it, put native plants in. Has, has you Sadiq for bringing that up, Kathy. And yeah, I just wanted to say, I've been really thinking about that and like, why not have super blooms all over Los Angeles? Um, the Theodore Payne Foundation has an amazing collection of seeds and very conveniently in these uh, times, you can get them shipped to you. Um, so like, why not, you know, why not put together a really robust seed collection for, for fall? And, you know, particularly if we do have some, um, some rain that will hopefully will, um, we could have really robust blooms um, throughout the city, which would be amazing. Yeah, and, yeah that's how and, you know that you've actually changed the culture when people stop taking pictures with murals, Instagram <laughs> pictures with murals and start taking them with plants. But yeah, I think that we're gonna get there, Kathy. We're gonna get there. <laughs> we're gonna do it. Um, and yeah, to to follow up with Philip was saying, like, take some time with it, plan it out. Like, think you know, now's the time to start. You know, get get rid of the lawn. You know, start getting rid of the lawn. Think about what kind of plants you want. Get your seeds figured out, and and it's a fun. You know, go down the wormhole. Go down the rabbit hole. I think you will. People will be very pleasantly surprised with how much fun it is, and then you can end up saving a bunch of money too so it's a win-win and you can solve all the world's problems <laughs> yeah and it, three dollars a square foot for the department of water and power for ladwp it's it is um it's a good chunk of money that can help if somebody's trying to do that you know do uh do it yourself project that three dollars yeah. can go a long way if you're taking you know um, control of the, your project and really want to do as much of it yourself. It's kind of hard to do right now and like have your friends come over because of social distancing. But mm -hmm. you could, like you said, start planning now, you know, and start looking at um, planting templates. We have planting templates on our website. Uh, we have uh, two templates, I, or excuse me, we've got four or five templates that are dedicated to native plants. Um, the only thing that's missing from them specifically are um, are, are areas that are designated as, um, uh, you know, rainwater collection areas. So swales or, or rain gardens, but that, that can be easily adjusted depending on, you know, where your downspouts are. But those are great um, starters for, you know, looking at what would do well within your climate. And, and we've actually got those templates based on different microclimates here in Los Angeles. So somebody who's in the coastal region has a whole list of plants that they would use versus somebody who's over in the foothills. So yeah, it's a great resource that most people aren't aware that we have, um, but it can be a really good way to kind of start thinking about what you want to place on your property and how you might want to configure it. Has, has LADWP, this is a totally off topic, but so forgive me, have, have they, uh, has LADWP, have they reached out to place it like these shows that, that are on like HGTV that have these, uh, like they rehab these houses and they always put down sod. That's the first thing these, it, these people do. It, and I look at it so idiotic. Is, is there an outreach, like a media outreach to these types of shows where they can implement a, 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 you know, a bioswale and, and native gardening and talk about the advantage to that? So not specifically with those particular programs, um, but that's a great idea. I am actually going to follow up on that. Um, but what we have talked about doing is um, going back to our hands-on workshops. You know, we, we work with one of our customers who hosts the workshop on their property. And, we, you know, we work very closely with designers that we provide to them to help um, you know, develop it and, and figure out like the best way to build in all of the requirements for the program, the, you know, the plant density, capturing rainwater. Um, and I've actually talked to our marketing staff about building a, like a short, like 30 minute episode for hey. our, our city um, television station going through, like that is that kind of format of, hey, this is the homeowner. This is the process. Oh, these are the challenges, right? Like, oh, I didn't okay. know that my soil is got, I've, I've got compaction issues, or I didn't know that my soil is, you know, I had somebody trucked in a bunch of soil at one point. And so the soil that's over here is different than the soil that's over there. And oh, you know, and all of these challenges that go along with it so that people can see it's 
um, even with the program, the you know properties that we're hosting these on, there are challenges, and and it's yeah. it's these are the things that you kind of need to think, you know, keep in mind. And we could have those collections of videos available to the public so that they can see how what the workarounds were. Oh, great! That, that would be really fun, um, wouldn't it? And I, I would watch oh, yeah. it totally. Um, would you? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll help you. We'll, we'll we'll be involved with it if you guys want. This sounds like a lot of fun. We'd love to yeah. collaborate. Yeah, oh, we have, that would be we have our own great. television station for the city, and I was like, this is great. Let's, let's this do is it. Awesome. Perfect. As I was sitting there watching the conversation go down, because it was so funny, because there's always the homeowner like that we, you know, we, all of our homeowners are amazing to work with, but they're always they always come in and they're like, I don't know anything about plants, and I'm just gonna trust what you say. And mm -hmm. I tell them all the time, no, 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 like yeah. ask questions. And if you say, I don't like purple plants, then we'll find you something that meets your needs. That's not a purple plant, you know, or is it in a different, in a different color or, you know, meets whatever, whatever vision you have. Right. Um, but I always think it's kind of funny because at the end of the conversation, after I've told them that they are like, oh no. I hate these plants. I want that kind of a plant. And they, you know, it, it's it's the same kind of experience that you see with the designers on these shows where they're like, you know, working with the homeowners. It's really, it's really, um, it's humorous and it's really entertaining. And so that's why, as I was watching it, I thought, this is perfect. This is like great television. The personal, the personal side is so important. Yeah. Ah. And what's, yeah, and it's wonderful because we've had situations where people have had, um, one of the last homeowners we worked with, who, and they had a ton of natives put in, um, but they did have one lemon tree that they said we, they wanted to keep because it was it was planted um, when their daughter was born. Oh. And so there was a there was a um, you know a nostalgia associated with that. And so we had to design with that in mind and how what could we do, but where could we place it so that it was more appropriate for that particular landscape, um, but still had a position of you know of prominence in the yard and it and it actually was placed in a much better location where it offered shade and they could sit and now they could appreciate it in a way that they couldn't may have done so before yeah it is it's such a personal thing and it's something that um that we can contribute to a greater goal within our own space and our own lives and as uh, our conversation went today we went from one one person's vision um which is totally beautiful thank you lake um I want to see your garden in person sometime soon. And we tried to kind of weave that into a much greater story of, uh, of how we think about nature and wilderness and, 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 and urban, you know, ecology and, and biodiversity within our urban uh, lives. So thank you, Charlie, for that conversation. That was thank you, uh, really, really fun. Thank you, Charlie. Thank yeah. you, Lake. Charlie. And awesome. Thank you guys all for tuning in. Thank Join you. us next week for Poppy Hour. And uh, have a great, great week, guys. Have a great Thank week. You. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank, you. Thank you, Lake. Bye. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you.